Hello historians, my name is David Lister, uh, I've recognised a few names in there, and you'll reckon who I know. Since 2013 I've been working on spigot weapons of World War II, and this has provided quite a few amusing stories which I've put in the book. As the two most well-known weapons are probably the Blacker Bombard and the Piet, I will be doing a piece on the Piet later in the year for the Royal Armouries. So it seems sensible to cover the Blacker Bombard in this little broadcast. How it will work? I'll waffle on for a bit. I've been trying to keep the time down because the last test run I did it came in at 45 minutes which is a bit too long. Scott is sitting over in chat. Who, he's a moderator. He can take your questions and pass them on to me. After I've finished, there's only about 20 slides, then we'll have a question and answer session and you can ask questions about any of the stuff I do or any of the contents of the book. Towards the end of the book, there is actually, or well, towards the end of this presentation, there is actually a discount code as well, which I suspect you'd like. I will apologise. I've had a bit of a crazy week this week, and this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. So some of the flow of the text and the which is between slides is probably going to be a bit janky. But without further ado, let us begin. Oh, technical issues. There we are. Most of you have seen this slide. It's just a little bit of fun which I decided to put on there. Take a guess, yell out in chat if you want, which of the German tanks you can think of, which the, the Bombard would be able to kill. Let's do this because to illustrate the Bombard's reputation today. And there's a lot of preconceived notions about it. Most of which I think are unfair, We'll be dealing with those as we go. Before we go on, I do want to just avoid the, the sin of assumed knowledge. A lot of people ask me what a spigot weapon is. It is essentially a long rod over which a bomb or projectile is placed. When the propellant is detonated, the bomb is thrown off. The spigot remains, sort of like reversing the principle of a firearm. What happens to the spigot when it's when the projectile is fired is interesting. It depends on what sort of spigot it is. A fixed spigot, which is the most common throughout history, it just sits there. The recoil is absorbed by the mount and fed into the ground. In a dynamic or moving spigot, they're both the same, well, they're different names for the same thing. The spigot recoils itself and absorbs a large portion of the recoil. It's usually used to recock the weapon. The most well known one being the Piet. We will, of course, come to some later versions of that. Whenever you're talking about spigots in World War II, you have to talk about Colonel Blacker. This gentleman is possibly the most important person when it comes to spigot weapons in the British Army. There's a brief bio biography there. I also love this picture of him. Here he is working away, probably just after World War II, in his workshops. You can see him there. With mad glint in his eyes, he creates some terrible weapon of destruction equipped with a safety monocle as well, which sort of sums it all up, I believe. He... Between 1935 and about 1944, I believe he invented around about 92 different weapons. That is rather high 
number I've like seen. And he was very much the sort of inventor who will just build it and see what happens. There are accounts of possibly Blacker, it might have been somebody else. During trials at the Ordnance Board, when the weapon wasn't working properly, he breaks out a toolkit and starts tinkering with a weapon there on, in the middle of a trial to try and get it to work. That just, that's basically what I can say about him. In 1933, we get the first Blacker Spigot. He submitted a patent to the patent office, unsurprisingly, for an attachment to a service revolver to turn it into a grenade launcher. Most of the patent talks about a full bore conventional style right grenade discharger top of this revolver. However, in patent he also includes the options for going with a spigot weapon. The following year, in 1934, he comes up with this, which is really his first purpose-built confirmed spigot. How this works is actually quite difficult to display explain but very simple in reality so if you'll excuse my appalling artwork we have this the spring holds the firing pin and rod it applies pressure thus when the hammer of the revolver is cocked the spring or the firing rod is pushed backwards this means that the firing pin is in a safe position and you can just push the bomb onto the spigot without it detonating in your hands, which is always a good thing. When you pull the trigger on the revolver, the hammer moves forward and catches the base of the firing pin rod. It then pushes against the spring tension and triggers the cartridge. The interesting thing is, because the, the L-shaped bar is between the hammer and the cut revolver bullet, it doesn't fire any bullets as the hammer is prevented from striking the, cut, the projectile cartridge. This enabled Blacker so to put in a little mechanism, you can just see it just on the top of the gun above the hammer, to slide the L shape or 90 degree turn in and out of position. This meant that you could select to fire either a bomb or flick the lever to fire bullets. This was designed as a close defence weapon. If an enemy soldier popped up just a few yards in front of you, you just flick a lever and you can shoot him. Blacker also did some work on um, the grenades. He suggested a, a tail with cartridge attached to a number 36 Mills bomb plug. The plugs go in the bottom of the grenade and they're just there to hold all the components inside and they just literally screw out. If those tails were issued with a gun to a grenadier, there was no separate ammunition train or logistics. They could just literally take a grenade off an infantryman, screw in a new plug, load it into their launcher and fire it. It also had the advantage of being able to use it as a normal grenade where you just throw it, pull the pin and throw it. This was actually built, and we will come back to it in a little bit, but before that, in 1935, we have the first conventional spigot weapon, the Arbalest, or Arbalast, I can never get it right. This design included two very important inventions from Blacker, one of which was at least patented. The other was certainly uh, what's the word? paid for by the Royal Commission after the war. This is the first one, the most obvious one, is the weapon is a dynamic spigot. You pull on the two cocking handles. This retracts the spigot into the case of the gun against spring pressure 
and it, whereupon it locks inside. You put your bomb in the loading trough, and then when you're ready to fire, you pull the trigger, which is the lever sticking out to the right hand side of the gun near the base plate. This releases the spigot or the spring. The spigot is then thrust forward. The firing pin is at the base of the spigot and it sends the bomb on its way. Recoil instantly recocks it. The other important invention is the radially expanding cartridge. It's very difficult to picture this or describe it, so bear with me. Spigot weapons have an inherent flaw. To load them, you need a fairly large degree of gap between the tail tube of the bomb and the spigot. If you don't, then you get an air bubble at the top of the spigot gets caught and it becomes very difficult to load. Of course, if you've got a non gas tight seal, when you trigger the propellant cartridge, the amount of gas which leaks out is going to be variable. This means that the weapon becomes wildly inaccurate as you never know the muzzle velocity. The radially expanding cartridge fixed that. It's a tube in two parts. When the, car, the explosion of the propellant occurs, the pressure forces the rear part to expand to fill the entirety of the tail tube of the weapon. This forms a gas tight seal and the weapon then becomes consistent. The upper last has a clinometer at the back. You can just see it in front of the trigger and you can also pivot the weapon through a cuff about four degrees either side by using the dial on the bottom of the bipod. <coughs> That was in 1935. In 1937, we have British Army issues a requirement for the light mortar with a platoon weapon. There's a list there of all the weapons which would be submitted, including the 1934 patent. Of course, the two inch mortar, which we all know about, would eventually win this. However, Blacker was there trying. It's curious that he didn't actually try to submit the arbalest at that trial, but he didn't. One thing we do know is that the 1934 patent had been modified somehow. Unfortunately, we don't know how it had been modified. It was just the description of some of the components of it meant that it had obviously been changed. In 1938, the arbalest would be trialled against the two-inch mortar. And although it did initially come in for some favour, in the fact that the arbalest was actually lighter than the two-inch mortar, nearly every other factor on it was considered inferior. Especially as they were considering or starting development of a light barrel of the two inch mortar, which would make it as light as the arbalest. <clears throat> it didn't help that the build quality of the items going into the arbalest were a bit shoddy, shall we say. And Blacker quickly realised this. He um, took the arbalest away after the trials and sat down and really refined the design. He went through every single part of the design and tarted it up. The following June, I believe it was, in 1939, he resubmitted it against the two-inch mortar. And although he had improved matters, the two-inch mortar was still judged to be a superior piece of equipment. And so the arbalest was retired officially. One final thing about the early bomb throwers, like the 1934 patent bomb thrower would reappear. In 1944, Blacker wrote to the war office trying to get them interested in the idea, but at that point in the war, they just refused to get involved. 
What happens between the June 1939 trial of the Arbalest and September 1940, we actually have no records for. There is two books, each with very short passages about what happened. <clears throat> Certainly nothing happened until about Dunkirk in 1940. Then Blacker went along to Ministry of Defence 1, Melissa Jeffress and the research department there. Whereupon he just showed them the arbalist. That is how Blacker was brought on board to MD1. And he began working on a new weapon. That weapon is often described as the experimental gun. I would note that the, pit, the experimental gun it may be the gun at the bottom here. I say may because the description we've got of the experimental gun doesn't match in all aspects here. However, the experimental gun was continuously worked on for several months with constant redesigns to try and get a weapon which could function properly. There are similarities such as the saddle, with the trigger housing being very similar. We know that for about seven weeks after Dunkirk, the experimental gun, or the arbalest, was being modified, redesigned, and rebuilt into the experimental gun. So sometime about late August, or mid to late August, I should say, the experimental gun was at a demonstration at Chequers, in front of Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Here again, the report, the two reports we've got are roughly in line. We know that it fired two projectiles. The first one was said to, in one report to be a negligent discharge, which nearly decapitated Charles de Gaulle. Churchill may have seen that as a bonus. We, I'm not entirely sure. But the second, but both accounts agree that the second one second shot of the day was aimed at a tree about 500 yards away and it scored a direct hit. I do say aimed loosely here because the experimental gun in this particular iteration had no sights so it was a completely fluke shot. After this Churchill had seen the weapon he backed it fully and he ordered it into production for the Home Guard. From then until early, or well, winter 1940, the experimental gun was constantly rebuilt, redesigned, and changed to try and get a weapon which you could put into production. The main problem was that this was a recoiling spigot design which was causing a lot of technological problems to try and get a recoil buffer, which could absorb the shots recoil. <coughs> a lot of opposition to this was from the Ordnance Board, but we do have quite a lot of details of the experiments. One of the first ones is against an A-13 cruiser tank, which they had spare. The gun was removed, and over the front of it, a armoured plate was placed. This was about 1.25 inches thick. A postage stamp was stuck to that and used as a naming point. The experimental gun was fired at it, and as near as anybody could tell, it hit almost exactly on the postage stamp. At which point, a large scab of armour was blown off the back of the plate. It shot through the turret, smashed into the rear of the turret, ripped the rear of the turret off, as you see on the top right there, and the rear of the turret had a hole blasted through it. If you look at the bottom photograph, that is actually the shot of the rear turret. The front plate was mashed into the inside tank, and it became so intermingled with the superstructure, they were unable to remove it. That was a pretty impressive performance. 
Those of you who know your way around tanks will have heard the term scab. It does appear that the experimental gun was firing high explosive squash head. This is a type of round where it's filled with plastic explosive. Upon impact on a hard surface such as armour, the casing shatters and the plastic explosive spreads out over the surface of the armour before being detonated, which sends shockwaves through the armour plate to blow the scab off. My suspicions on this were confirmed when I found these pictures of test shots. That is an almost perfect demonstration of a hash round which has hold an armour plate. Now I highlight this because conventional wisdom today says that hash was invented by Sir Dennis Burney in 1943. Here are the relevant sections from his patents and blackers. You can see that the main difference here is that Bernie's, for want of a better term, Hesh, is contained in a vessel which will deform on impact. His sort of best description is a sort of wire bag. In my opinion, that would actually make the ground worse and less efficient. And the fact that nobody has used something similar probably agrees with me. Blacker's patent, however, talks about the plastic explosive pancaking against the surface. So I'm pretty certain that Blacker's got this one. He invented Hesh, Bernie didn't. In March 1941, the Ordnance Board held the final trials of the Bombard in the form which we have recognised today. It passed them with flying colours, much to the Ordnance Board's disgust. They had spent the last few months trying desperately to get the, any weapon from MD-1 to be utterly refused. And so it was getting quite petty to the point where Winston Churchill was starting to get very, very angry. And it was only the fact that the person in charge of the Ministry of Supply, I think it was Anthony Eden, was backing the Ordnance Board that they didn't all get fired on the spot. Um, the Bombard at the time was seen as, well, to quote one Home Guard officer, the answer to the Maiden's Prayer. At the time, the Home Guard were suffering a morale issue. They felt that they were getting the dregs of armament supply. Although they'd all been armed with a rifle, it was a P-17 rifle from the US and was thus seen as inferior to a Lee Enfield, which was the iconic weapon of soldier. You were not a soldier if you did not have a Lee Enfield in most of the public's eyes. <clears throat> this was further reinforced by some of the want of a better term, Heath Robinson contraptions which they'd been equipped, the Home Guard had been issued with up until then, such as the Northover projector, which is essentially a modernised black powder cannon. So there was a distinct feeling that they were not getting modern weapons. This was affecting morale. Then along comes the Bombard. It is purpose built for them. It is a modern weapon. Highly deadly, as we've seen. And so, every, these started to enter service and everybody became really happy. Now, compare that view of the Bombard to the current day view of Bombard, where it's just one of those dad's army weapons, which is a colossal joke and can be safely ignored. It wasn't very efficient, it didn't do very good. And other disparaging comments aimed in its general direction. If you go around and look on various websites online, you will see plenty of those. How did we move from the original view of, uh, from the Home Guard to the modern day view? Well, that can all probably be changed to one event at the Brickworks at Horham in Sussex. This happened on the 12th of October, 1941. 
a regular army formation in the area and the local home guard battalion got together and they had a demonstration day where they would show off all their individual equipment and to use it in its effect in the afternoon it was a term it was time for the bombard to shine in front of a regular army when they pulled the trigger the 20 pound anti-tank round which had been loaded exploded on the spigot the result was at least one home guard killed possibly a second the records are slightly confusing five further personnel seriously injured one had his arm blown off and four more lightly wounded from then on a lot of home guard became very dismissive of the blacker bombard it was seen as a dangerous weapon and this is where you start getting the stories about home guardsmen trying to trade in bombards for some machine guns and other such unhappy thoughts and it's likely that that cluster of reports from home guards have been replicated as the only version of events and repeated by modern commentators one of the tales weirdly does have a slight bit of proof to it and that's the story that the home guard will kill the gunner of it or sorry the bombard will kill the gunner of any one who fires it that could happen if you look on the right hand picture you'll see the um tube just above the gunner's forehead that's a rubber pad it's not a headrest if the gunner was to place his head against it when firing the recoil from the weapon firing would be transmitted down his neck and spine and break them which would be pretty terminal it's more there for if his head is too far forward when the weapon's fired the rubber pad will move him out his head out of the way before he takes any serious injury so there we have the status of the bombard in the home guard and today it was also deployed to north africa the top the picture here is the new zealand division demonstrating the bombard to the durham light infantry in somewhere in north africa i believe the caption said it was in tobruk the new zealanders had obviously heard about the bombard from soldiers in the uk as they had the same view of it they kept it with the battalion kitchens and as they drove up and down the desert in one of the retreats in the back and forth of that warfare they decided that they'd just leave their bombards in place and destroy them while evacuating and that was pretty much the end with the new zealanders however the indian division and the indian army in general had a very different view of it as you can see from a quote at the bottom there was it's also from one of the Indian divisions we actually get one of the few combat reports we can find for the bombard there was a German pillbox or bunker which had been set up in advance of their lines and it was calling down highly accurate fire onto the Indian division causing quite some problems so overnight they infiltrated the bombard which could easily be broken down into man pack loads into no man's land got it within range of the bunker and at first light blew it off the face of the map the indians are one of the large users of the bombards but it seems that they used them pretty much in all the theaters they fought including the china burma, burma india theater the problem is it's almost impossible to get into the indian records I've managed to get or get people into records from Australia, Germany, US, Canada, UK, but not India, which is one big problem. So if anybody in the future wants to know where to look to do more work on the bombard, it's going to be there. In service, bombard had two main types of ammunition. 
You have the anti-tank bomb, which is, as we discussed, a Hesh round. Note also the number 283 Mark II fuse. In the Horan Brickworks disaster, the reason the bombard exploded was because the fuse had been put in upside down. So the Mark II fuse appeared almost instantly afterwards, and it, as you can see, it's got a flange on the bottom of the fuse which prevents it from being put in upside down, so that can't happen again. The other bomb is the 14 pounder anti personnel bomb. This enabled the bombard to have a roughly similar effect to a 3 inch mortar. And they had some problems developing this. The warhead is made out of cast iron. And when they filled it with the explosive, they found that the fragment quality was get, they were getting was too small and too light to cause any serious injuries. They then had the choice of getting a warhead made out of steel, but that would dramatically drive up the cost. So they, car they searched around for new types of high explosive filler and couldn't find one, which would work. In the end, they put a chipboard box inside the warhead and then filled the box with the explosive. This absorbed enough of the explosive force that the cast iron would then fragment properly, which is a very unique and cheap way of sorting out the problem, I think. It's quite ingenious. There was another type of round for it, which is, I believe, until I found the documents for it, completely unknown. It's a hollow charge round. For those of you who know your tanks and armored vehicles and stuff, hollow charge is basically high explosive anti-tank or heat round. This dramatically improved the penetration. It also lowered the amount of explosive that needed to be used in the bomb. I would warn you that the picture we've got here, we don't know if it is or is not one of the 10 pound bombs. I suspect it is. We know where this picture was taken. It was at the Kerr's Country House, which was the MD1 test and research establishment. The weapon is clearly a bombard and it's being loaded by a large projectile. We know that the hollow charge round was a six inch projectile, very similar, which is identical to one being loaded. And the projectile here does actually have what appears to be a standoff probe, which you would need for the hollow charge. So on the balance of probabilities, I think this is a hollow charge round. It was going, the idea behind this development was to use the bombard during D-Day, which considering it's the 77th anniversary, I feel we should talk about it a bit. The idea was to land the bombard with first salt waves. As those would be mostly infantry, they wouldn't have any protection from German armoured counterattacks. If they did have the bombards with them, they could potentially fight off the German counterattacks. And follow on waves could bring in heavier weapons such as conventional anti tank guns. At which point the bombards would be switched to protection of the line of advance and flank security. One thing these bombards were to have was a wheeled attachment. Now, we've not talked about wheeled attachments, but there definitely were some. And they're not very well known about. Up the top left, we have the first plans for a wheel detachment that we can find. These were drawn up in Cambridge, in East Anglia, by the Home Guard there. I think it was a gasworks platoon. You can see from the bottom two pictures how it is meant to be used. When the arms which are holding the wheels are down, you get a good ground clearance and you're able to tow the weapon. When you want to go into action, you just unlock the arms, swing through 90 degrees, place the gun on the ground, stand on the front axle, and this would force a ground anchor into the earth and enable it to absorb the recoil, and you're ready to go. What is interesting about this collection of information 
is we do know where the picture on the right hand side was taken. And that is in Yorkshire, one of the West Riding battalions. If you look closely, you can also see that the wheels and arms which are holding them are different in each version. This indicates that home, the home guard are sharing information between themselves on weapon systems which work and how to build them and then constructing them locally. Sort of Darwin effect of weapon, home guard weaponry. I don't think that's been ever considered before. So another nice little surprise. Anyway, to answer the original question, what tanks could it kill? We know that the Hesh round, 20 pounder, will go through 65 mil of armor. So a Panther's 70 mils isn't going to protect it. A hollow charge would be able to deal with a Tiger head on. What about a King Tiger? As the muzzle velocity of a bombard is quite low, the ballistic arc is quite high. That would flatten out the front slope on the King Tiger, and it would probably allow it to knock out King Tiger through the front with the hollow charge round. Unfortunately, this is all hypothetical and rough guessing. I would say that the bombard has a rate of fire of around 12 pep rounds per minute at maximum, although six was considered normal, that might have tipped it in its favour. Anyway, all this was brought to you by this handy little book. I've included a slight list of all the weapons I've managed to find and cram in there. There are other stuff, there's, bits, there's quite a bit on the sticky grenade, though that's not a spigot weapon. It should have been released last weekend. Amazon says it was, but they've got no stock. It looks like it's going to be released at the end of July, but nobody told me. So, or not July, sorry, June. But you can pre order. If you do want to pre order, then you go to Pen and Sword. There's a link there. And the code at the bottom will give you 25% off, which is. Nice little one. Also, that 25% off applies to any books bought in, in the, from Pensor's website. It appears to be a long term code, so if you ever feel like getting a title, then that is for you. And that is all I have for you. So, I'm just going to nip over and say I invite you to start asking questions. Yes, sunscreen. If a mouse is hit on the underside by a bombard, it probably would die. Interestingly, MD1 had a weapon like that. It's called a kangaroo mine. It fired a wad of explosive upwards, which was then detonated. So it's basically slapping hesh rounds on the bottom of tanks. welcome sunscreen now got any more questions anyone four say one those are both um it's a bit like uh hedgehogs it's the best way of describing them but if you think of them as single shot hedgehogs so it's just one round you give me a second, I'll find a nice little picture I drew up for one of the videos I did.
You want to know about the anti-aircraft spigots? Okay, that's fairly easy to do. Um, the anti-aircraft spigots. Uh, this happened around September 1940. Blacker went along to Vickers Metropolitan in London during the Blitz, and he suggested creating something similar to the experimental gun using the um, legs off of Vickers Vulture, I think it was, the landing legs, because those have got suspension in, and that would provide the effect of a recoiling spigot. You then take the 20 pounder high explosive shell, load that on top, put a time delay fuse on, and fire it straight up. Unsurprisingly, Vickers Metropolitan were quite happy to do this because they had thousands of landing legs of an obsolete plane which was never going to do anything, so they were quite happy to palm those off to the government. The government and the War Office were less interested and told Blacker to concentrate on developing the experimental gun. That's all I have pretty much on those. It doesn't seem to have gone anywhere, but there were anti-aircraft spigots. Blacker was one of those chaps who decided that his latest invention, like whatever it be, was the answer to all the questions. Interestingly, on the subject of aircraft, Blacker um, was the first one to propose heliborne heli infantry. That was in 1940. And unsurprisingly, spigots came in there. There's something called the Fly K. It's very similar to what would be a Clark family spigot. It sort of goes over your rifle and fired. What's Project XD? No sunscreen, not quite that bad. <clears throat> but as that will go into the other presentation, I don't want to spoil the surprise. Chris, what is Project XD? I've not heard of it. Probably one of the many, many, many ones I've missed. If you describe it, I might have actually, I might know it as another name. <clears> 
The bigot is actually a very interesting weapon. It's an, you know the FP45 Liberator pistol? I believe it's an attempt to make that or turn that into a silenced weapon. And yes, if you get hit by it, it sounds pretty unpleasant. Male or female. You could use the bomb sunscreen. You could use the bombard as a shoot and screw weapon, anyhow. The hold fast, the pedestals which dot the countryside, there was usually three of those to every one bombard. So you just sort of fire from it and then pick up the weapon, which two people can quite easily do, race it over to the next location, drop it down. To start firing again. Um, you don't really have to expose yourself that much, as quite often the gunner could pivot through 90 degrees, at which point you just need to lift up the bomb, slide it on, and you're done. Tim, the Leeds talk, the Royal Armouries one, I don't know as yet. They haven't got back to me with the exact date. It's probably going to be towards the end of the year. Um, they're talking about after the summer holidays. What they tend to do is during some holidays, they'll do content, which is more focused towards the younger person. After the summer holidays, they'll go back to content, which is more for the adult, which they, they describe them as the academic lectures, although they do want to find a better word for it, which is sort of like what we've just done. Sunscreen. Yes. Those things. Their name, they're called Holdfast or Pedestals. That's the beautiful thing about the Bombard gun. It's all in one package. And all you need to do is find the pivot point and you just drop the entire package on. You don't need to do anything else with it. You don't need to lock it in. It just works. Yeah, the are blast That's one of the things which wasn't very popular with it. However, you can do it from where you're lying it's not actually that big a weapon it's a bit like a two inch mortar where you can load it and fire it from behind the weapon Oh, that thing. Uh, if you nip out, I don't know if you know that I do um, a regular blog post over on Blogger. Let me just find the links. Doesn't help that Firefox has just changed everything. No? First of all, XD isn't actually a, um, what's it? Isn't actually a spigot weapon. It's slightly different. It's a conventional weapon with a bottom placed in it.
Chris, try here. There's a few plans in there which fit. <laughs> that pretty much describes the design of the weapon. There's a few plans there I found uh, um, Blacker's family archive, which um, one of them was the weapon you describe. It was a shoulder, if memory serves, it's a shoulder fired recoilless rifle. You load the glider at the front end. The blast is sent up at about 120 degrees from the launcher through a tube. It's all very weird. I'm not entirely sure that it's. I think it may even have been built because I remember there being quite a lot of items in that collection which looked like they could have been part of it. Although, now again, another problem with Blacker's collection is that Blacker would repurpose items. So if he's got something which works for one thing and it doesn't go anywhere, when he moves on to his next fancy he, and he's got an item, he'll re he'll redesign it, he'll rebuild it so that it fits into that. And post-war, Blacker really went into um, recoilless weapons in quite a large way. Well, recoilless weapons and rockets. Those were his. But yeah, I'd suggest that that post will help you out. There is a picture kicking around of Blacker with his recoilless rifle and he's right in front of a very large house, country house, with lots of windows and he's pointing the um, vent tube right at them. It's like, yeah, I wouldn't fire it there, mate. <laughs> One of the other things about Blacker's recoilless weapon is it was recoilless. It was a bit like the Davis gun, where it would fire a counterweight. And the counterweight had a parachute on it so that it didn't injure anybody on the way down. Of course, if you fired several rounds of this, you'd have a nice little cluster of parachutes hanging around above your position, which sort of gives the game away. A novel platoon weapon. Would this be the Stewback platoon projector? then no, I don't believe I would because it sounds like it's another one of his recoilless rifle period which he went into after World War II. This is basically spigot weapons. 
World War II, this book. It's amusing that there's still stuff to find at Q, though. I thought I'd clean that place out. Could you send me a reference number for or even the reference for it? I can find it through discovery from that. I'll certainly get in touch. Yes, sunscreen. Speaker weapons are mocked. And look at the um, views of the pier and the bombard. When you compare them to other nations' weapons, the Pier is probably superior to both the Bazooka and the Panzerfast. But it's always the joke weapon. That's part of the reason why I wrote the book. Because the Bombard the Bombard was the first weapon I looked at. And it just sort of grew from there. Especially when you consider the Bombard's reputation today compared to what it should be. Very different from reality. The pit will punch straight through the front armour of a tiger quite happily. And as for short ranged, it's bit vastly longer ranged than um, weapons such as the pit Panzerfast. And a lot more accurate at the maximum extreme range. But yet, yeah, as you all know, Germans, their equipment is automatically good. No, the petard was quite an interesting little weapon. Annoyingly, just after the manuscript was sent away, I found out about a second petard round. You're familiar with the £40 one. Apparently, they developed a £30 one as well. Unfortunately, I found out about that too late. If you look at footage on YouTube of the Piat, 
I reckon a good peer tip crew can get away two rounds per se or one round per two every two seconds, maybe three. Even the Panzerfast can't match that. Oh yeah, there's 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 a lot more to go over on the bombard. But as I say, I talked for about forty minutes there, which is a bit excessive, I think. The Piat one's gonna be interesting because I'll have to keep it to about twenty minutes. Right. Looking at the time, it's gone eight o'clock. Apart from that last question from Horan, unless anybody else has got anything, I think we'll call it. Horan, the Royal Army's talk will also be on YouTube. They have a YouTube channel somewhere, and I believe they do regular talks on it. So, sunscreen i could waffle on for hours about the bombard I had to cut so much out to fit it in such as the trials of the bombard on a ship as an anti-shipping weapon you're welcome sunscreen if anybody has any follow-on questions you can always find me on facebook with that or you can find me on Twitter with that. It shouldn't be as obscure, and hopefully it won't be. With that, I will close it down, download the video, edit it, and get it reposted back up tomorrow. Anyway, thank you for attending. I hope you all learned something, and I hope you enjoyed yourself. Chris, I will be in touch because I want to know about that brochure. <laughs>